You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a little bit of a deeper dive into a gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget, and how you can become a gratitude believer, and one to three takeaways from today's show and uh, today's guest. Uh, just so people want to know where to find me, it is on the, available rather every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. It is downloaded to the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and other places where podcasts are available. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I do appreciate that. And people ask me a lot about the, the Gratitude Journal. If you're interested in the Gratitude Journal or you want to find out more about my coaching, one-on-one -on -one or group coaching, you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And also you can see in the background, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com will get me as well. So, so that's the intro. And then I get to my favorite part, which is to introduce my guests. And I'll just tell you right up front, I'm excited to have my guest on today. And if I read every ounce of his intro, we'd be 20 minutes on the show. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about Steve Brody so you know who you're about to listen to. Steve has over 30 years of marketing, general management, and consulting experience within large corporations and within privately held firms. Steve's experience has been in the consumer packaged goods and service industry, including beverages, pasta frozen and refrigerated prepared foods, electronic information services, and distribution services. Steve is active in consulting at the executive management level. He currently operates advisory boards for CEOs of firms from diverse industries, which we're going to hear about a little later, plus one group of key executives from those CEO members. He's also been involved with Vistage, which we'll hear about a little bit later. During the prior 10 years, Steve has served as president of separately, several privately held firms owned by venture capital capital investors. Previously, Steve served in various brand management and general management positions within the Minute Maid Company, the $2 billion juice division of the Coca-Cola Company. Steve has an MBA from the University of North Carolina and a BS degree from University of Maryland. Steve is active in several community organizations and is married and has two grown children. And as I said, I could spend another 10 minutes going through as many things, but I want to get on to talking to my guest. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, David. I'm, I'm glad to uh, be able to make your uh, fancy show here. <laughs> fancy show. I think the jury's still out on that, whether it's fancy or not. So my, my first question, I always like to set kind of a context. Tell the listeners and or viewers how you and I met. Well, we were both a few months ago using an advisor that we still are, who is an expert on uh, on, on LinkedIn and the effective use of LinkedIn. And her name is Ellen, uh, Ellen Malcolm Moore. And we both were clients of hers. And she did a few activities getting us uh, as clients together on, uh, uh, on some activity during each week. And, and I think that was, uh, that was where the initial, the initial introduction came from. You are exactly right. And I remember thinking too, how nice it was for me to see somebody that was in my age range with all these young <laughs> whippersnappers that are around everywhere. And I think, gosh, Steve's got the same color hair, whatever I've got left, left the same color hair as me. So, well, for the people that, that will not know, go back and, and walk us back. You've had some tremendous uh, career situations and changed and moved on. And I know that I talk about gratitude a lot, and I think it's, I'm grateful for this position, but I want to get to a next one, or I want to do something to grow my career and so forth. So walk back a little bit, if you will, kind of how your journey started, and maybe after college, and maybe the first job that you did, and kind of what your plan was for at least at that point for your career. Well, yeah, so I, I came to Texas, to Houston, to a division of the Coca-Cola Company. 
Mm. So number one, I never had any expectation of coming to Texas. I had never, never visited Texas, never been here before. I, I grew up in the Northeast in, in New Jersey and actually went to uh, high school and then college with someone that I, uh, that I married. I, I met her when we were in, in high school, actually. Oh, and, wow. uh, and after graduate school, when I was taking my first assignment, um, I met someone and it was through a family relationship through someone in her family in, in the supermarket business. And that's really kind of where the first gratitude piece, if you will, came about because this was her, uh, her stepbrother. Her mother had remarried and, uh, after a death and her stepbrother, and he was president of a supermarket chain oh, wow. of, a, of a major supermarket chain in, uh, uh, in in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, mm-hmm. and and as I was getting on to graduating and, and talking to him, his name was Milton, talking to him about different occupations, and I knew I always had an interest in marketing. I mean, in college, and you know, and some of my majors were were in marketing and also psychology, and and how you know it led to kind of the concept of how do people make the decisions that they make. You know, mm. what, what is a decision-making process if you're going to buy a certain product or use a certain product? And, and that's where the psychology piece kind of overlapped. So I, I always knew I, I wanted to pursue something that was going to have an, an uh, involvement with that, which meant for me, that meant it was going to be a consumer company uh, mm-hmm. as, as opposed to a, a business-to-business or B2B. Well, I was introduced to someone through him and actually, uh, in, in that initial introduction, came to my opportunity to be interviewed and uh, and moved to Houston to join this division. Uh, so it was a, it, it's a division today. It's called the Minute Maid Company. Is the name of it. It is owned by the Coca Cola Company. It's a division of Coke, and it's responsible for non carbonated beverages. Mm. So. It's quite different from the soft drink business. There are elements that make the business uh, very different as to how the product gets to the stores and the franchise system, which is what the Coca-Cola system is worldwide in 220 countries around the world. But the juice division, so this is Minimate orange juice, high sea fruit drinks, and a bunch of other products that are non-carbonated. And, and uh, I came into the marketing department and brand management and product management. So actually my expectation, David, was when, when we moved here, you know, I had no family here. My wife had no family here. Um, I told her we would move to Houston for two years and then we would move back to the New York area where all of the, yeah. where her family was, where my family was, where a lot of the, the consumer goods companies like General Foods you heard of, yes, of it course. was he- headquartered in New York in New York area and other. And I just never expected that uh, we would stay here this long. I mean, that was 1972. Wow. That was 1972. We came to Houston, and so every time I looked at it and uh, the potential in, in, in the time period to possibly leave a promotion would come along and, mm. and, and I just kept having more and more opportunities. And before I knew it, I, I stayed with this division. It became 16 years, wow. 16 years with the Coca-Cola company. So, you know, I was in their retirement plan and invested in that. Uh, I didn't stay there long enough to get to the full 25 or 30 year level, but um, but I do have a pension from Coke. And while I was there, I got stock options and, and I was an officer of this division. So uh, after 16 years, when I left the corporate world to go into phase two, which I'll hold off on for a minute and see what your questions are. But mm-hmm. that is uh, when when I decided to leave the large corporation and, and move into some privately held company. So phase one for me was was the experience and the discipline and the learning from what I would say, not from an ego standpoint, but just from a description standpoint, that probably is the world's greatest marketer. And, and it was just, it was wonderful to be involved in, in that kind of company and to have your learning curve 
constantly increase. Yeah, and and great point too. And I like the way you broke it down. Phase one, then we'll talk about phase two in a second. On phase one, I think a lot of people would agree with you. Maybe the world's best marketer, certainly at the very top or near the top. But you said something that I think is really interesting, and I think the listeners might uh, get inter- have be interested in is how do people make the decisions that they make? So what did you find out in terms of where there are several key items that go into that decision or is it across the board? But what did you learn? Because that's really fascinating about the marketing and especially B2C versus B2B and you're going to the consumer. What, what kind of came about when you learned that through that marketing? Well, I, 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 would, I guess I would identify for you two things. One, I would fall falls into the, the logic area uh, David, kind of the logic or the thought process as how you look at how someone looks at a decision or what they understand about a product or a business. And, and the second one falls into what I would call the emotional, mm. the emotional decision. So the first one, think about as more in, in a way, think about it like an academic um, environment, meaning okay. you're, you're going to learn something about an industry and in the, you know, in, 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 in that division, uh, it, it, everything was modeled after, you know, the, the grandfather that really, that every company in the food business really modeled after was Procter and Gamble. Yeah. Every, uh, almost every food ma- and manufacturing company in the U S followed the, the, the disciplines that were created at Procter and Gamble. Mm-hmm. So that, that meant what you did as a as an as an early marketing assistant or a product manager, and you were constantly exposed to certain roles and tasks that you had to perform. You had to evaluate industries. You had to evaluate competition. You had to evaluate. So I mean, this is kind of a structured evaluation. Wow. You know, you could fill in the blank. The product almost didn't matter, David. You would say, "Well, we're going to put you on product number two. And, and you're going to go through the same kind of analysis that maybe you learned in, in, when you were first working on product number one of, of who uses this product, how do they use it, how is it used in the family, Where, what is the competition, what are the trends, well, you can see that all of these become uh, almost a template, those questions you could ask for any given product. And that's what I'm referring to when I say the logic side of mm-hmm. you evaluate. Is it, so is this an industry that's growing or is it an industry that's declining? And, mm-hmm. and, and when you're in a big company like I was, and they had sizable budgets and you had market research. And so you, you weren't just judgmentally coming up with this. You had sources of, of facts. I mean, you probably heard of the, the AC Nielsen company, which is one sure. of the biggest market research companies. And and you would buy trend data. You know, mm. what is this brand doing? What is that brand doing? And, and what are the growth rates? So that's what I would call the logic side, okay? Yeah. Then if we, if we shift over to what I mentioned as the emotional side, um, and, you know, now we get into the world of perception. When I say emotional, let's also use the word uh, perceptions. Okay. So in a consumer business, depending on the size of your product and the size of the industry, advertising and promotion is going to become rather important. There there are smaller type of brands that don't have the budgets that can't spend as much on on advertising. So you're working with an ad agency and you're working in the world now of positioning. And Mm -hmm. what positioning means, it's not always factual. And and what I mean by that is you're never never going to lie about a product or make up things that aren't true, but but we we fall into the area of perception versus reality. And we're getting into what do people think about something based on what we expose them to, meaning what do we say about the product? What do they see? Uh, is, it a, is it a fanciful commercial? You know, you've probably seen things in your career where there are celebrities and, you know, you get into a sure. lot of very interesting challenges some companies use a celebrity to right. help promote their products and that personality or image of that celebrity kind of gets um, uh, attached to maybe that product mm-hmm. you know if it's a 
health oriented or refreshment or sports oriented product, they may use a sports figure as the celebrity, exactly. you know, and, and, and now we get into a whole bunch of complications of, because that's the, the, the spokesperson, but suppose that person falls off the deep end. Right. <laughs> and right. Now, now you have some wacko. I mean, you know, this represents your brand. I mean, you know, that's a risk, right? And, well, so and I think, Steve, a, sorry to interrupt, but I was saying when you think orange juice, I think, and this shows my age, I think of Anita Bryant, who was the, the spokesperson yeah. for orange juice. And then didn't she get into some trouble for some of the things she said? So, well, well, no, you're right. You're partly right. So, so you're correct. She, but she represented the, the industry. The, oh, the growers or something. Uh, yeah, right. The, so the one that, uh, but she did, was the spokesperson for the industry. So actually the brand within the division was the Minute Maid brand. Right. And for many, many years, when I was a younger product manager, the company did use a celebrity. When I say his name, you'll remember it because you'll remember the campaign. Some of the, my grandchildren who are, you know, nine years old to 18 years old, they, <laughs> they, won't, they won't remember them. But the spokesperson for Minute Maid Orange Juice was, you know, da, 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 uh -huh. was, was Bing Crosby. Oh yeah, he was the spokesperson for Minute Maid Orange Juice for right. you know like a, a decade or so. Yeah, and it was, I remember that. It was so, but 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 that's when I when I say psychology or perceptions, that's what I mean by that. It, yeah, that, that's the that's the second way that that decisions uh, are are involved. You know, and and one thing I want, I'm anxious to get to phase two as well in a moment, but one more thing on phase one is that, and I happen to know this from prior knowledge about you and getting to know you, uh, tell the listeners how you were responsible for taking something from frozen concentrate to uh, the, its liquefied form or in its original form, because the, I think that's, a, really cool, that's yeah. a cool story. Well, I was with a, uh, another person who I reported to, he was the brand manager and I was the product manager. And and, and, and we were in the new products department. So it, it, it does, it's kind of interesting. It overlaps some of your, your approach about what, you know, the gratitude questions that you ask. Because I, I, I became very close to this individual. We were very good friends. He was a few years ahead of me and he was a mentor. Uh, and I worked for him and, and was part of that team. Well, the two of us were assigned to a new products department. And we were studying trends in orange juice. And so this was back in the, in the early 70s and early mid 70s. And, and uh, if you remember, and not to go off too far in the deep end, but, but you just have to look at one of the things that was happening with trends. And what I mean by that is that was a time period when women in the home were predominantly housewives. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were not working women as much in the early mid 70s. But that trend was changing. And you could see year by year, more and more women were taking on a working role in the household and you'd have mm -hmm. two working adults. Well, and so that was a time period, if I throw out some other products to you that you'll remember that all were creating these trends. If I mentioned to you, the microwave oven. Sure. was going through major growth yep. at, at, at that point in time. And with working women, and the, and the amount of time that they wanted to spend cooking a meal for their family or the children, mm -hmm. food habits dramatically changed in the right. 70s and 80s. There was less cooking from fresh ingredients and more things that were convenience-driven. Mm -hmm. So what's convenience-driven? Take a box out of your freezer. Let's, let's say it's macaroni and cheese or mm -hmm. Stouffer's lasagna, which was frozen, Take it out of the freezer, put it in the microwave oven, and in two and a half minutes, you have dinner. Right, right, exactly. So this was the change that was going on in the industry. Well, we were looking at those kind of changes with orange juice because Minute Maid was the creator of the frozen concentrating process. Right. Why is that significant now? We don't want to have to get into too much detail about the production system, but there's one thing that does need to be understood. And the consumer would never really get into much detail about this because when you do a commercial, it's only a 30 second commercial. You can't mm -hmm. explain it very long. But here's the interesting fact. And you may, you may not even recall this or know this. And that is that oranges are not available 12 months a year. Mm. You can't buy. Now, truth is, 
what I'm saying is slightly incorrect. It depends where you live in the United States. Right. If you live in if you live in California or you live on the West Coast, where almost all the fruit that's used for eating oranges is available, those oranges grow 12 months out of the year in, okay. in California. Mm -hmm. But if you're using oranges for juice, those oranges don't come from California. Oh, why is that? Because the 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 just the the way the orange is formed and the amount of juice that's in them, all of those oranges for juice come from the state of Florida because it has right. a very thin skin mm. and, the, and that and it absorbs more water. Well, the, and those oranges and in that part of the country, you get some cold weather and some freezes mm. during, well, those oranges are only available six months out of the year. Oh, interesting. And that's where all of the orange juice is sourced from or the oranges that are from Florida. Uh, in the so now you get into the dilemma. I, I use the word dilemma. Mm -hmm. If oranges are only available six months out of the year, how are you going to have orange juice in the household twelve months out of right. the year for your right. family? Exactly. For your family. Exactly. Well, Minute Maid created a frozen concentrating process that that little bit of the water is taken out, the concentrate stays in the freezer, and it lasts at zero degrees just fine. And you have it available all year long, and you add some water back just the way it would come out of the orange. And now you have oranges available all the time. Right, right. Go so back to the concept I was describing of what was happening to the American consumer and women. As easy as just taking orange juice, thawing it, and adding some water, and it's available 12 months a year. That now, from market research, we found that was not viewed as convenient because yeah. I, I, I had to prepare that the night yeah, before. Exactly. So what's the choice? You take that product and you don't freeze it or concentrate it. You just take it and hold it refrigerated in a container. Right. Now, right. It has a short shelf life. It won't last for two, three, four months and only lasts for actually 28 days is wow. all it'll last. Wow. So, wow. But that's where we were on the team that was uh, evaluating that the consumer seems to be changing. If, if we just stayed doing what we were doing with frozen orange juice, advanced a clock 10 years down the road, we probably were gonna be out of business on the orange juice. Business. Interesting, interesting. So we started to focus on what was called the ready to serve part of that business in, in the dairy case. And in a refrigerated container, we got the shelf life up to about 35 days, but, oh, but really not much, not longer than that. Right. So, you know, it was it, the industry was changing then becomes the, the short answer. And, and we moved that business dramatically to the ready to serve form to where today the frozen product still exists, but it's less than 20 percent of the industry. Oh, wow. And you, and you think about, too, the birth of fast food and the McDonald's of the world and all those. And that really kind of started, I think. I don't know, maybe late fifties into the sixties, but certainly by the seventies, it became a big thing, but yeah. you just brought back an old memory, which always speaks to my age, our age, what have you, is I remember so much as a kid to your point about fast food, opening that frozen orange thing and putting it in the pitcher, adding the water and stirring. And I could stir for like an hour, it seemed like, and there's this still big chunk of orange <laughs> juice in the center. You, you had, to it, uh, had to let it thaw first. <laughs> exactly. You had to let it, so the, therefore, I, therefore it was not as, so, the, so this was, you know, we became a, so the trend, so what's the trend we're talking about? The trend is the convenience trend. Yeah, yeah. The convenience exactly trend. Right. And so that that's what we were seeing in the, dramatically impacting in the 70s and 80s to, to the extent where today the percent of working women in U.S. households, I mean, I, I, I may forget the exact number, but I think it's significantly over 50 percent of you're all right. households that have working women. So right. convenience, convenience then becomes a significant element of how long does it take someone to prepare dinner? or you know for in the fact food. i imagine that the generations today put two minutes and think how come this can't be ready in one minute or something you know it's just <laughs> it's so funny it's like the days when you had before you had the internet and it would get up to high speed and you see the picture load one line at a time and you go what is going on here and and these generations don't appreciate what we went through so well let's move on to uh, to phase two and uh, bring you a little more, bring us up to speed a little bit more what's happened in the last 10 or 20 years for Steve, because as I said, you've had multiple uh, different uh, types of experience, which are really interesting. So kind of go into phase two after those 16 years with Minute Maid and when you moved on. So phase one was the corporate world, you know, the large company and corporate world. Phase two 
was moving to privately held companies. And so think of it this way. And, and when you look at yourself and the activities that you do, are, are you as an individual more interested in being a small fish in a large pond? That would be the corporate world in a very right. large corporation. Or are you interested in being a large fish in a small pond? Right, exactly. So I, I decided I was recruited away after 16 years. I had people, search firms contacting me on various things. And, and there were some interesting opportunities that became available to step into general management and instead of being a VP of marketing, to step into a company as president of a company. Uh, and now these were not, these were privately held companies, but not any company that I started. I had no interest in starting a business. In fact, I thought those people that started a business from scratch, David, were actually uh, crazy. Mm -hmm. It's like, why would you, why would you take that kind of risk? Put, yeah. you know, go to a bank, sign away all your assets because you're going to start a company and, and not know if it's going to be successful versus join maybe a smaller or regional company that was in business, but, but needed some help for where was the future going to, to come from and, and where were you going to take that company? So I ended up joining a privately held company that was owned by an equity group. That's an investment group. Mm -hmm. The original founder of the business had already sold out some of the shares he held a small portion but he had built a company it was successful and, and and but he needed more money and decided to sell the majority of the shares and it went to um, investors now this is a whole segment of our economy that there are small to mid-sized companies and when i say small to mid what's referred to as the middle market Mm -hmm. middle market. So that's not a company like Nordstrom's that I know you are involved with or Coke. It's companies that are doing, let's say on the low end, about 5 million or 10 million in revenue mm -hmm. up to on the high side, about 500 million of revenue. Okay. That's that niche of companies that would be in this, in this middle market. Right. And, and those companies are often owned by an investment group. Mm -hmm. It could be owned by the original founder that, that created it, but maybe he sold portions of it. And so I was attracted to some business that way to come in as president of a firm that wanted to take this particular business that was regional, wanted to grow it faster and, um, and continue to grow to a national. So over a period of 10 years, I ran four different businesses that were all sequential, one after another, not necessarily owned by the same event. So, so I was a hired gun, if you will, David. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so the way, the way I described that, to, you know, I never served in the military. When I was in college and it was the Vietnam era and that was the days of the draft where, you know, where, where there were, you remember, there were, there were lottery numbers. And oh you yeah, were, remember it and well. So, and, and so I didn't, I, I had, you know, whatever a high number was, I never was drafted and didn't, go to Vietnam and, and, but, um, uh, and, and so some of these businesses were in, in different parts of the country and, um, the owners at, at, at some point were looking for some type of exit. And so I was offered an opportunity to step into a company that I was able to help grow it to, larger entity and the incentive for me was to have some equity provided in that company meaning that investment group would provide some equity that if i could help achieve certain goals now what were they going to do now we get into the whole world of finance and capital these this is not a warren buffett type approach who right. holds a company holds it forever you right. know holds a company for 20 30 40 years these were investors that would generally hold the company for say five to 10 years. And then what would they do with that? Their intention was either to turn around and sell it to somebody bigger or do what's called an IPO, which is an initial public offering. Right. And that's not easy to do, but it's a very attractive, very attractive kind of the rainbow idea is to take a company public. Right, take correct. a private company public, and and that's a whole 
we could have a whole separate hour long discussion about what are the positives and minuses about public companies, but it, it really comes back to a critical question, which is if, if a business isn't generating a certain amount of profit that you're gonna fund its growth itself organically, internally, how are you gonna fund its growth? Where are you gonna get the capital from? Right. So these equity groups, they, they, they play a role in our economy. Mm -hmm. You know, some people, you know, the, the, you see movies about it and some of it is kind of a negative terminology. They call these people sharks. They right. call them sharks because they, you know, they're, they're known to be kind of financial wizards and people that really don't care too much about the culture of the organization, but they just, they just want to buy a company, hold it for a few years and then flip it. Right. Exactly. And, and so, but that's, but that's a whole other segment of our economy. So I got involved with four of those in a, in a 10 year period of time. Mm. And it was very interesting. I mean, but it was a whole, it was a whole different phase, if you will. And, and I enjoyed having more control over a lot of those decisions. And, and in essence, I was operating more as, as a bigger fish in a smaller pond is what, is what I would, what I was describing to, to you. Right, which, which actually is really interesting because I wrote that down, the small fish, large pond. You and I have had similar experiences being in the big corporation and being that small fish in the big pond. But it really is fun to be the big fish in the small pond because you just have a lot more uh, uh, freedom. There's just a lot more creative, creative aspects or outlet, if you will, or whatever. So, so let's move on because I asked you recently about uh, what's your favorite thing of all the different things you've done. And you said, doing what I'm doing now. So let's bring the listeners and viewers up to speed to kind of talk a little bit about what you're doing now, of which I know about, but I'd like you to explain to the listeners and the fact that you enjoy it is more than anything else you've done. So after the fourth company that I, I said, it was about a 10 year period of time of, in those companies in, in, in phase two, and you know, I sold some companies, bought some companies with those equity groups. Um, but then after the last one, which, which was in the late nineties, I was in the, in the process with a regional company trying to take it to a national level. I didn't know if I was going to be able to get it national because I needed an additional $6 million of equity to take the company for the business plan to the next phase. Well, I didn't know if that was going to happen. And, and during that time period, I started to look at what now, what might be some other approaches. And I was, I was contacted by someone who had been at Coke when I was there. He left a little before I did. And he joined an organization that was based in San Diego. It's still based in California. Uh, and, and it's involved with being a coach to a company, being a CEO coach. Well, what is a coach? So the company is called Vistage Worldwide. It, it's the largest CEO membership organization in the US and in a, they're in about 12 other countries. And, and what is that? It's the same kind of companies that I described to you, more in the middle market, these 10 to 100, 200 million dollar size companies that were privately held. But these people for the most part don't operate, David, with a board of directors. They just mm -hmm. don't have that kind of formality. Or if they do have a board, it's a, it's a family member or a relative. So the question becomes, how does that leader, how does that leader grow and improve his own effectiveness? How does he improve his or her leadership skills? So they became part of a peer group, and that's what Vistage was. And it, it's a model where there's a person who is identified as a chair. I was a chair. So I was in the Houston market. I was one of 15 people. There are 500 of these people in the United States that are owned by, that are affiliated with just that one company. And what do they do? They create a peer group, which is an advisory role that someone comes to a meeting each month and starts to identify challenges or opportunities. And instead of them recreating the wheel from scratch, the model is how do I learn from someone else and learn faster so that I can continue to expand my company and myself as a leader. I, I thought it was just a fascinating model. Yeah. And, and so I became one of those people. I became a chair in the Houston market. I think you may have met some of the people that are in the Seattle area yes, I that, are, 
that are involved with these CEO peer groups. And it's all around how do they improve their performance? Right. So, you, so you're doing individual and in addition to the group meeting or every, so there's no competitor or no vendor who's allowed to be in one given group because you're going to have to talk about really confidential information. Right, right. Your status, your financials, your your strategy of where you're going to grow. And you wouldn't do that with a competitor in the room. Exactly. So, so that's organized and facilitated by the chair, which is, so you, you end up with a group of 10 or 12 or 15 people that are all in kind of different businesses, but every one of them has a, a similar need, a similar need. And they're trying to figure out where did they take their company next? Mm -hmm. They're trying to look at where do they go next as an owner? And, and now you get into one of the really, I, I'll go back to the psychology questions that, that I mentioned to you earlier about decision-making on products, but here's a little different nature of psychology. I said, these are privately held companies. And so this is not a morbid thought, but it's kind of the reality. Imagine if they don't have a board of directors and they're the owner, suppose something happens to that person and, and the question that I ask one of those prospects is when I meet someone is, tell me what happens if the plane goes down. Yeah, yeah. And they look at me like, what, what, what is this guy? What are, you, what are you, are you asking me? Are you asking me, do I own life insurance and will my family be okay? <laughs> I'm saying, well, no. I mean, that is a part of the question, but that, that really isn't the question I'm asking. What I'm asking you is, you just said to me, you got these 100 employees, let's say. And you've got these four vice presidents that report to you. You just told me how important they are to you. And, you know, it's been said to people that there's only two ways to leave a company. One is vertical and the other is horizontal. <laughs> <laughs> Which means <laughs> yeah. vertical means you choose to leave. You know, right, or, right. Horizontal means you're, you're carried out. Right, so, exactly. So, you know, the challenge, the challenge that any privately held company has and these are not necessarily questions that people like to deal with because who wants to talk about their own death sure but but think about any of us as a family member as a person uh, or if you're the leader of a company you, you've got a whole range of employees well do you not have a fiduciary obligation to what if something happens to you now, what happens to this business? So, right, so exactly. that's, a, that's a significant challenge. Yeah, it's exactly true. So well, we only have a few minutes left. And so I want to make sure that we include what you are doing under your headline, if you will, that kind of came sort of after Vistage or almost in tandem. But tell everybody kind of what you've got going now with your CEO group. Well, so, I mean, I have coaching clients. I have people that I meet with individually that are not part of any group. I mean, they're, they're the same kind of individuals like I described, people that are business owners and I meet with them every month. I meet with them, the CEO, once a month, once a month or twice a month. And I let, I was with Vistage for 20 years. So I mm -hmm. left Vistage in 2019. Uh, I stepped out of that and I was looking at a change of, of some activity and, and I wasn't gonna join any other other peer group because Vistage was kind of the, the top and the leader in that whole right. segment. They, they were the right. best of the best. But I began to look at it and said, well, maybe I would add one of those similar models and do it on my own, and, and which is called a mastermind group, which right. is the same thing of, of having a peer group. So I started to create a website that I'm building up and, it, and it's called CEO. I was able to get the address, the URL, um, which I was very surprised that I was able to get it available. Uh, it's called CEOmastermind.com. Nice. So I'm going to be forming a group of 10 to 12 people, and it'll be similar in that space to creating. So I'll have a peer group, and it'll be alongside of my other coaching clients. So between those major activities, that's that's the way I'll divide my time. I mean, I mean, I don't have to work 100% of my time, meaning I don't have to work every day, eight or 10 hours a day, uh, but I'm not going to, but what do you mean, what am I going to, you know, I'm 73 years old, and if I'm not working and stimulated by helping people and looking at the, 
what am I going to do? Go, go play golf every exactly. day or. Exactly. Well, and the, the word that I use is when people lose their purpose, I, I just think it's problematic. And, and if you look at your long career and look at the various positions you had, and you think about the amount of times that people said things like, Steve, I'll never forget when you said this. I'll never forget when you told me that you're the only guy that ever took the time to show me how to do this. I mean, you get things, statements like that. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's hard to put a price on those. In fact, they are kind of priceless and things. And so, well, we got to wrap up and I want to, I'll save this one question for the last. If you look at such a varied career and all the things that you've done, the big fish, the small fish in the big pond, the big fish, the small pond, and, and the, you know, the corporate world and the, and the private equity world world and all those things so what's and you only can pick one thing what would what does steve brody know today that he would have liked to know at 18 that would have helped him at, at 18 18 or 20 somewhere in 18. there <laughs> that, that's uh, that's a long way back the, of, <laughs> i know the feeling what i what i what it would have been good to know and, and didn't learn it until you know many years later about going through it is uh, I'll use this phrase in, with involved with the title of the CEOs of the people that I work with that, you know, I invite someone into the room, whether it's a mastermind group or whether it's a, a coaching client, you know, I invite someone into the room and into a conversation. I invite a CEO into the room and something different happens. What happens is a human being walks in mm -hmm. and that human being has a whole set of, of, opportunities and challenges and fears and things that they haven't ever gone through. And so the, the part that I didn't really know until many years later was, was the, the strength of and the importance of the culture and those personalities. Mm -hmm. Often it's not the brilliance of what the product is, or in fact, if you read, you know, if you read a lot of the people that have written books, you know, about about intelligence, which is called IQ. And there's another phrase that's called EQ. Right. And EQ is referred to as emotional intelligence. What, what I learned after many years is there was far too much emphasis in our country and in the kind of competitive marketplace that we are in the United States. There was far too much emphasis on IQ and what college you went to and how bright someone is and not as enough emphasis on EQ, which is how good of a of antenna do you have? How good are you at relating to other people? And let's use the word motivating, motivating and, and getting insight uh, for help translate to other people. That's probably the biggest secret in business. And it's it's not who's the smartest and who knows the most about what software program. It, 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 it really is who is the most trusted and, and, and the kind of personality that people want to work for because they just feel that their life is going to be a better experience if they're around that individual. And that took a lot of years to, to find out. Such a, such a good point. And I think about um, teaching a course years ago and the, the, the source I got my material from said that their surveys prove that in the, in the business world that 85% of your success in the business world is going to be due to your interpersonal skills and 15% to your technical skills. And so that's exactly what you're addressing. So what a great, what a great nugget. Well, we've got to wrap up and thank you so much, Steve. I so appreciate you being on the podcast and let me remind everybody um, there was, gosh, just some great takeaways there from Steve today as I knew there would be. Uh, just as kind of as a reminder, my podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and leave a five-star rating if you like what you hear, which I always appreciate. Uh, to purchase a gratitude journal and find out more about my gratitude speaking and coaching, you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. Also, a lot of people ask me about the Monday Morning Minute. I send out a one-minute video every Monday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific time. A lot of people like to get that to start their week off. And if you'd like to receive that, go to your text window and type in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And then the message box, put in gratitude guy, one word, and that will get you your in Monday morning minute. And also as an exclusive for my podcast listeners, I'm, 
I'm offering my three-month proprietary gratitude coaching program with two extra months free for those of us hear about it on the podcast. So just reach me at david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And finally, thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate all the listeners and viewers. And until next time, I am that gratitude guy, David George Book. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. <laughs>Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.